Dear friend, today is a busy day. Festival has begun, and there are many travelers from all over the region passing through. I'm up to my shoulders in work and only have a moment to jot down a journal entry, so I apologize for the brevity. I had to take a moment, though, to tell you of one traveler who stayed at the inn yesterday as festival was beginning. He had a wonderful helping spirit, a name longer than any I had ever heard, and a story that left me somewhere between heartbroken and hopeful. The Inn at the Edge of Greenwood, Chapter 1. We Keep Each Other Up. The day that you find yourself traveling on the road is quite sunny. It is a very warm day with only a couple clouds up in the sky. And at times, perhaps a little too warm. Uh, that, that direct sunlight beats down on anyone walking the roads. And after a while, you find yourself coming into a small, hard to even call it a village or a town. But there is a marketplace and a couple of small houses. And on a hill, kind of at the center of wherever this little hamlet might be, an inn. It is a two-story building with field stone around the bottom and wood paneling up the, up the top. And you see a variety of people kind of coming in and out. It seems to be pretty, pretty busy today. And you're coming here right around the noon time. Ah, a stretch. This is a look around. Ooh, this is nice. This is a nice little place. Check my pockets. Oh, yep. Got a few copper, a few silver. Let's get ourselves a drink, why don't we? And I'll mosey my way on over to the front door. Tip my straw hat to some people stepping out, and then venture inward. They give you a nod, uh, not seeming to be too surprised by the presence of a stranger here. And you step into the inn. Um, as you step in, you see a fairly large open space with a fireplace off to the left-hand side. The noise that hits you is, is pretty loud. There's a lot of people here sitting at the tables and kind of moving from the bar. Um, and you do look over to the right-hand side and there is an L-shaped bar that kind of takes up the right-hand corner, uh, a kitchen behind it uh, with a small door that leads back that direction. Uh, and at the bar, you see a variety of different people sitting, um, mostly halflings and gnomes, um, as are a lot of the people that you've encountered so far in your time in this land. Uh, but there's a couple humans. There's a dragonborn sitting down at the very end. Uh, and the bartender behind uh, the bar is a fairly young human man, brown hair, brown eyes, fairly non-assuming, wearing uh, an apron uh, over, his, over his, his tunic. He is quickly kind of pouring ales and wines for different people and taking orders that are being shouted from across the room. Oh, well, he seems busy. Hope he can spare a moment to get me a drink. Uh, finding an open seat, I sit down take off my hat, which is polite to do indoors, and rest it on my knee, and then carefully withdraw the little straw that I've been chewing on, and tuck that into the straw of my hat, and wave down at the innkeeper. You got got a moment? Uh, it takes him a minute before he's able to actually turn around. He kind of like, uh, turns and points for a minute, and you see kind of like a, a, a bit of anxiety on his face as he is you know, being pulled in many different directions at the moment. But he, uh, after maybe 30 seconds or so, finally kind of whisks over. He's like, I am so, so sorry. It is a little busier than usual today. Um, welcome. Can I get you something? Yeah, if you've got an ale, I'd appreciate it. And then after I finish that, do you need me to lend you a helping hand, friend? Oh, my gosh. That's, that is so kind. Um, first of all, light or dark? Uh, well, let's go dark. Okay. And then, um, uh, uh, he kind of looks around as more people begin to file into the inn. And he goes, I don't normally do this, but if you would help, the drinks are on me. All right, brother, let's do this. Okay, well, let me get you one first. And he kind of goes over and pours a dark ale for you, slides it over. And then uh, when you're ready, just pop behind and uh, you just help me pour. 
He kind of turns around and starts pouring wine and other ales and whatnot. Well, shoot. Just leaning back in my seat, I take a quick glance around the tavern, sipping at my dark ale and enjoying the moment. This is this is exactly what a tavern should be like. Once done, I'll stand, my worn boots clapping the ground, and brush all the dust off myself from traveling. Step behind the bar. Hey, you, what can I get you? The dragonborn has actually flagged you down. Um, he's like, I need, a, I need another refill here. It's a whiskey. Whiskey it is, and flips the bottle up between his fingers and starts just mad dash dishing out drinks. Okay. And contrary to his very s- slow drawl nature, he's quick on the uptake. Awesome. So you begin quickly pouring drinks for everyone. Um, the bartender, the innkeeper, had been in the kitchen for a moment, comes back out, sees you, and sees how quickly you're working, and is kind of like, oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. And this is his first time getting a full look at you, as you had kind of already sat down at the bar when you first came in, uh, and, he, and he spotted you. Would you like to describe what he sees? Yes, uh, a tall, middle-aged man with sandy, dark hair and brilliant blue eyes. Looks definitely worn by life. Clothes aren't fine. Battered armor and a heavy shield on the back. Very, very relaxed looking gentleman. Human, just friendly as all get out. Very quickly, the innkeeper begins kind of moving around you and the two of you kind of find your rhythm uh, behind this bar as you kind of shift in spots and he takes the left, you take the right, you switch, you take the left, he takes the right. Um, you get a chance for a couple, you know, quick, brief conversations in the middle of all of this. Um, he does ask you at one point, where where are you coming from and uh, where are you headed? Well, I reckon that I'm from Ustalov, and I'm headed wherever the road takes me. Ustalov? I'm not familiar with that. Is that across the Western Sea? Oh, you know, I never was very good at that geography business. It's a swamp land, kind of. Oh, you don't got to worry about it. None's not important. Well, that's okay. Uh, sorry. And he kind of gets pulled away to go back to the kitchen for something. You're back there for a good 45 minutes uh, before things begin to slow down from, from whatever rush this is. But after a time, it does kind of trickle down. And the innkeeper's kind of like, thank you. Thank you so much. It, here, let me pour you another one. <laughs> he pours hey, you another dark problem. ale. Mama didn't raise no slacker. Well, I, I appreciate a hard worker, that's for sure. Uh, I imagine you were just passing through, otherwise I'd offer you a job. <laughs> well, as intriguing as that might be, I think that I, my uses are better elsewhere. He kind of looks up and down at your armor and your shield, and he's like, ah, you're probably right. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. Um, if you have a moment after I finish kind of cleaning, I'd love to pass some time and just get to know you, you know, this this. Kind stranger who's who's helped out me today. I reckon I got time for that, sure. All right, give me a moment, would you? Uh, heads off, finishes cleaning different tables. Um, he does start to stoke the fire up just a little bit. Still, you know, early in the afternoon, um, but kind of gets it going a little bit. And after a moment, you actually see them bring out a, a small roast, some sort of animal you can't quite tell on a spit. And they begin roasting it on the fire in the main room. Uh, the smell is... Delicious. Hooey! Smells like y'all know how to cook. Well, uh, when you live in a town like this all your life, uh, you look for the simple pleasures, and a good roast is certainly one of them. Certainly. I, you know, I think my grandma might have said the same thing. <laughs> so after a time, uh, he finally kind of comes and sits down, kind of leaning on the inside of the bar uh, across from you. He's like, I didn't even get your name. I am so sorry. Oh, no, not a problem, not a problem. My name is uh, Tibetaeus Tumultus Theodore the Third. You can call me Tibbs if you want. Well, I'm glad that you're letting me call you Tibbs, because that's a mouthful. Oh, yeah, a bit. My, you know, folks had so many kids, they had to start getting creative with it, you know? <laughs> so they were like, Tibetaeus Tumultus Theodore the One, and then they had the Two, and then I got Third, and then... You know, 12 more of them suckers came along and they had to make it simpler. Oh my so, gosh. So, uh, yeah. My, you know, some, one, my sister, she got jealous, right? And she started, she picked a fight. My brother, she's like, if I beat you in a fight, I get your name. So they tussled it out. 
Now she's Tibbleteus Tumultus Theodore the Second, and so he... she beat him then. Oh yeah, and oh now my. he's just Julie. <laughs> He he just loses it at that, as do I. Yeah, he pours another another ale for you, and he actually pours himself a, a light ale, um, and sits and drinks with you for a little bit. So tell me, you're you're obviously decked out in in fighting garb. Say you're coming from a someplace called Ustalov. Um, are you are you sword for hire or? Well, no. See, I I lent myself out to to the League of the Hunt, which is a guild, an adventuring guild. Based out of uh, Absalom. Adventuring so, Guild. What does yeah. that mean exactly? So, you know, kind of the basic thing. They're part of the First World Fortune Seekers Alliance. Don't know if you've heard of that at all. But they have a bunch of guilds, different ideals, and they send them out on jobs. But, you know, I don't I don't quibble too much with that. Well, we have a guild down south called Realm Shield, but they, they just help protect the kingdom and, and fight monsters and you know, keep trolls at bay and whatnot. I've never heard of... Any guilds in this land that actually just seek out adventure? That sounds exciting. Well, yeah. I mean, folks have problems, so they can bring their problems, and we'll be like, you know what? We can take care of that one. Anything from, like, dragons to party protection. We got it. You must have seen some things. How long have you been doing it? Well, shoot. I reckon about seven years now I've been venturing. Wow. And I'm not even the best one in the guild. Can you believe that? There are those who have been there longer than you. Not, not even longer. Sometimes folks are just better than you, and you just gotta give them a nod and appreciate their skills. Huh. Well, I can absolutely relate to that. <laughs> See, I was never real good for much. I mean, I, I'm a hard worker, but I didn't feel like toiling at fields or nothing. But I've always been real good at getting, like, beat on. I got all them siblings, I got all them nieces, all them nephews, uncles, aunts, whatnot. And they're just a rough house and bunch. And, you know, I could just take a beating. And one day I was like, I bet I could get paid for this. So I signed up, got a shield, and been taking a beating ever since. That's your speciality then. You just kind of jump into the fray. Yeah, I just stand there and let everyone else kill him. <laughs> he pours another drink. His second, you're probably third or fourth at this point. I hate to do this, but I, I wonder if I couldn't convince you to... Tell a, a story or two from, from the guild. Maybe maybe one of your adventures or, or one of your your guild members' adventures. I, like I said, we I, I live here and work here, and I see lots of people come through. And um, well, the stories that I hear help <laughs> pass the time. Oh well, you know I think that I think we could work something out. Tibbs leans back in his chair and stares off in the distance for a moment, trying to choose a story to tell. Well, if you want an exciting story, mm. it doesn't feature yours truly, but uh, it's it's one for the storybooks for certainty. I'd love to hear it. All right. And he polishes his palms together and leans forward in his seat, ready to begin his tale. Innkeeper leans forward as well, kind of getting in close, listening. So, like I was saying, the First World Fortune Seekers Alliance, right? This is back when they just first started out. And they called together a big old competition between the guilds. And they said, whoever won this competition got to go to an Osirian tomb that had never been opened before and face the dangers within. And their reward would be treasures that would take care of them for lifetimes. Of course, League of the Hunt, my guild gets called to the front. I was there when Lucy... Finley, Fafey, and Gordon went up on stage, were announced as the people who were going to be competing in this guild. And just to set the scene, let me tell you a little bit about these characters, alright? We got ourselves Lucy. This lady is just unhinged. She's got a laugh that would chill you to the bone, her hands, and a stick, and she's going to beat you to death with them. She's got like... You know the monk types where they wear like all the wraps and whatnot? Yeah. But she's also got the rage of a barbarian coursing through her veins. Wild thing. Wild thing. Then we got Finley. She's she's the leader. Uh, cunning is all get out. She'll stab you in the back and pick your pocket all at the same time. Avoid that one. She is trouble in, you know, a, a handbasket. I can't, I don't know what you get trouble in. 
I can't I can't imagine. You go to the store and you're like, hi, I'd like to buy some trouble. They give it to you in a handbasket. There you go. They probably would, yes. They probably. Then we got Gordon. Gordon's just... Hey, so he's a gourd. He's a leshy. I don't know if you've seen a leshy before. They're rather rare. They're like a little plant creature. And he's got just a pumpkin head. And his face don't move. That is remarkable. Yeah, it's magic. So what I hear from leshies is that they are possessed... By an unlike they're, they're a plant originally that got possessed by a spirit that had some sort of unfulfilled business, and then once that spirit is fulfilled, they just turn back into a plant. I'm gonna have to take a closer look at my garden in the morning. That is <laughs> yeah incredible. Yeah, so but he's got this weird face. He doesn't show emotion. It's just holes. Like if you just took like a circle and you punched into a pumpkin, you got those two holes for an eyes. Than just a line for a mouth. And uh, he just trembles at everything. He's scared. Scared all the time. Can't can't ever do anything. Just just shivering and healing. That's his business. He'll keep you up. <laughs> then you got Faithy. And Faithy, she's a wild card. You don't know if she's just going to drink herself under a table. Or if she's just going to be sweet as pie. Just never know with that one. She slings bolts from a distance. Crossbow, you know. Really handy to have one of those in your party. Sounds like a very eclectic group. They are eclectic and they get jobs done. And as what luck would have it and skills would have it, they of course win this competition. So they get to go into this tomb. Wow. I'm going to fast forward through the bits that are not quite so entertaining. Just them getting blown up by, by traps, fighting skeletons and mummies. Oh my that yeah. sounds terribly entertaining. Well, you know, that's just all in a day's work for entertainers and whatnot. But what was really exciting was when they finally stepped through into that final room and saw all of that treasure. Picture it for a moment with me. Just lining the walls in great heaps. Swords and fancy armor sticking out here and there. And in the very center of this ocean of gold, we've got this weird pinnacle of a rock rising 30 feet up in the air and on top of it is a massive sarcophagus the four of them are cheering laughing having themselves a righteous good time as they walk through all this gold and climb to the, and lucy climbs to the top followed by finlay and they lift off the lid of the sarcophagus anxious to see who's inside and would you have it a mummy holding a book is laying there all of a sudden Finley is thrown off of this hill. Jess crashes down to the bottom and the mummy is standing there in front of them, but in ghost form, just face to face with Lucy. And he's all like, are you here for the power? And she's like, sure. Because of course that's what she's going to say. If someone asks you if you're here for the great power, what are you going to say? Well, yeah, and they had just won the competition and gotten in. I mean, what was in the book? Well, I'm getting to that. It's an excellent question. So this guy goes on to explain that this book holds great, great power, which if you read it, the person who picks it up will die. But before they die, they can give that book to someone else and that person will gain unspeakable power. They can ascend to godhood. They could hurt all of the good gods in the world they could empower the evil deities of the world they're like this book is unspeakable treasure and not only that of course there is some terrible cult that is after it he begs them begs them to protect the book or have one of them die and give the book to someone else who would be worthy of becoming a god or protecting it for the rest of their life he doesn't have much time left, but he, he gets all angry with Finlay. He doesn't like the type of magic she's dabbled in. Occultism stuff, I guess, is closely associated with this cult. So before he leaves, he fades out of existence. He tells Finlay, don't you even think about touching this. Don't you dare. And as soon as he's gone, what do they hear but footsteps in the hall behind him? The cult. Now, no one was supposed to be down here. It was just supposed to be them four. It got open just today for the very first time, unsealed. So, shocked, they turn around, and lo and behold, Shadara walks in. Curse her name. 
Who's Shadara? Shadara is the leader of the Alliance. She's the one who put together the competition. They're absolutely confused as to why she'd even be here. So they turn and they question her and they're like, Shadara, what are you doing? She's like, I couldn't let you all see this without me. And they're there. They think it's weird because, you know, she's supposed to be a rule follower. She's supposed to be the one who set this all up. And little Gordon, shaking in his boots, is staring her down with his lifeless eyes. And he doesn't believe a word she's saying. He keeps pressing her, pushing her buttons until she reveals her true colors. She is from the cult. You were dead on right, mister. She wants so badly to have this book. And she summons these, these wraith-looking things to her side. And she's like, if you're not going to give it to me, I'm going to take it. What do they do? Well, they, they decide to try and stop her. One of them's like, why are you doing this, Shadara? You're supposed to be our friend. And she's like, I... Sh she basically reveals her evil monologue of the fact that she put together this competition to find the people who'd be strong enough to break through this tomb and get her here. So well, they've been used... Diabolical. Diabolical indeed. They've been used this whole time. Desna's bountiful bosoms. You just can't get back... You can't deal with that. Can't even fathom that kind of evilness. Did they win? Well, they certainly tried. They're fighting her. But these wraiths, they are overpowered. And they just fly straight through you and drain the life from you so they can feel themselves getting weaker and weaker. And scared little Gordon's watching them. And he doesn't know what to do. And he turns in the middle of the fight and he starts running for that pinnacle. Now Lucy and Gordon, they have a special bond between the two of them. Every time Gordon got frightened ever, you'd see Lucy kneel down in front of him and she'd say, We got ourselves a deal, little guy. You keep me up, and I'm going to keep you up. And every time they went on a hunt, they'd come back side by side. So she sees him climbing up this rock. And she is not about to let that little guy go take that book. So she turns and she sprints after him. Go flying everywhere as she runs. And she uses her good staff and she jumps with it. Leaps all the way up to the top where Gordon is staring down at this book. And she knows exactly what's going through his head. And she says, you can't do this. You can't do this. I need you. I need you here. We have to both be up in order to keep each other up. And they, they lock eyes for a minute, and he tells her he has to, and she begs him with all of her heart, just stay with me, stay with me, don't do this. And then lo and behold, Shadara sees them from across the room, and a wraith rises up level with them and screams. Now, Lucy managed to stay up, but little Gordon shriveled down into nothing. You seen, you seen old pumpkins before when they get all soft and sad? That was him just laying there in his little overalls, limp on the floor. And I, Lucy was like, just shaken to her very core. She's looking down at them. She looks across over at Finlay, who's close to death herself. And Faithy, who's shooting uselessly through this other wraith. Her bolt's just flying, and there is no winning in sight. So you know what Lucy does, right? She says, we can't do this without you, Gordon. I can't keep them up without you. And she reaches over, and she grabs that book. What happened? Well, she grabbed that book. She feels that dread come over her, and she knows what's coming next. And so she presses that book into his dead little hands and she says, Gordon, get him up. And she just falls to the ground and she's no more. Gordon takes that book and rises up onto his feet, glowing with the divine energy. He sees his friend Lucy and he falls to his knees and he's sobbing and he says, no, Lucy can't do this can't do this to me and he crawls forward to the edge of this pillar and she looks out across at Shadara and for the first time in his little gourd life he feels hate and he channels that power and burns right through Shadara leaving her into a withered husk like the one behind him 
Now, ere the fighting falls quiet, and everyone turns and looks at little Gordon, and he is holding this book, and he feels in his spirit that he has completed his task. Very slowly, his vines start to retract the ones that made up his body, and pull back to his head, which closes up slowly over the book, sealing it away for all of eternity. And Gordon, Slyfor snuffed out. He and Lucy lay there at the top, just guarding each other for forevers. Gordon the Gord God. Gordon, I don't know if he became a god. I, I, I reckon he must have, right? I'll pray to him, but like, he's, he's not in this world no more. Is that what it's like being part of your adventurer's guild? Not Gods normally. and Whew. crypts and... Not, it's never happened to me. Nothing quite so exciting, but what a doozy of a tale, don't you think? The innkeeper kind of sits back. He's like noticeably paler. A little bit of sweat on his forehead. Kind of grabs a towel and wipes it away. He's like, I'm not going to lie. That's one of the... I've heard some doozies. That's, uh, that's an incredible story. Well, thank you. I I'm so sorry. I never even caught your name. Uh, I don't even know if I could recall it myself right now. Goodness. <laughs> uh. Will you just take a minute to compose yourself, brother? Yes, well, um... Maybe pour me here, another ale. He, yeah, he, pour, he pours you another ale, shaky hands a little bit, sets it on the, on the bar and slides it to you. The afternoon is getting late, and he kind of tips his cap a little bit and is like, I, I've got some work to do in the garden, but you're welcome to, to stay here and, and take your leave as long as you like. Well, thank you kindly, friend. I think I will stay a bit night longer before I take myself an evening walk to the next location. Are you going to be spending the night here, or are you headed out in the evening from the town? I think I might walk a might spend the night under the stars. It's nice out today. Well, depending on how long you have, um, there is the festival tonight, hence all the, the number of people here. <laughs> uh, so we hope that maybe you'll join us in the, in the market square on your way out. Well, my brother Julie always said, never pass up a festival. Julie, the brother who lost the name to the sister. You're quick! Got it. He goes into the back uh, and begins work. Uh, you can hear the kitchen kind of cleaning dishes and cooking things up, and you can hear your muffled voices talking. Um, there's a few other people still in the tavern who eventually take their leave. New people come in, are served drinks. It's a nice, pleasant place to kick your feet up for a while. You'll sit there and watch for a bit. See all the people make friends with anyone who spares chat with him. And there are plenty who are drawn to this kind, friendly, interesting stranger with his shield and armor and straw hat. So you have many good conversations over the next couple of hours with different people. After a time when you decide to take your leave, um, it's starting to get a little late into the evening. And as you leave the inn um, and begin to walk into kind of the center of this small town, you do see of market stalls that have been converted into little areas with, with poppers and, and fireworks for children, people selling candied apples. There's a maypole in the middle of the, of the town, and everyone has a, a wonderful air of celebration about them as they begin to celebrate some, some day, some festival. You're not sure, but it's nice to see people celebrating life and happy. Yeah. Uh, Toteus will take a walk through get himself one of them candied apples, crouch peacefully sitting over on the edge and just view all these happy folk. This is the reason why he does all this. This is the reason why he fights. Make sure days like this never come to an end. Thinking about Tib's story, the sacrifice that Lucy made, is this not why we tell stories in the first place? to remember heroism, to honor the fallen, to remind ourselves that in a world full of magics, love is the strongest spell any of us can conjure. I hope to see Tibbs again someday. I'd love to hear if he ever found out what happened to Gordon. The festival will be going on for a few days yet. Lots of work to do, lots of people to meet. I'm sure a story or two will make its way into this journal. Till then. Yeah.